Okay, welcome everyone to the Women's Health uh, Cluster. Sorry, one second. Here we go, Women's Health Cluster uh, seminar series. I'm Lori Brado. I'm one of the co-leads of the Women's Health Cluster. Um, and I'm really, really delighted to be um, introducing our speaker here today. So first of all, um, the Women's Health Cluster, we recognize that we live, work and play and participate in community on the unceded, ceded and traditional ser territories of the 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history here on this land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We also acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's Call to Action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In all of the work that we do, we're committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Um, today, I'm joining you from my home on the Kwikwatlam First Nations, part of the Coast Salish peoples and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, um, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, so just a little bit about the cluster, the Women's Health Cluster led by Dr. Lisa Galea. I mentioned uh, that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be one of the co-leads um, in the cluster along with a number of other outstanding women's health uh, research leads. And a bit about the cluster, if you're not a member, we absolutely invite you to become a member. There's no cost to becoming a member and only lots to gain. So you'd be joining 230 other members. There's quite a, a number of events that happen like the trainee seminar series that you're attending today. We have um, members affiliated with a variety of different universities, not only within British Columbia, but across Canada and around the world. Um, and the research that our cluster members do span all aspects of, of women's health research across all pillars of CIHR science. For the student trainees who are logging in, there's also many opportunities to present your findings, to apply for trainee travel awards, um, and of course, to be in good community with other women's health research uh, members. So there's the URL for those of you who are not a member um, that would like to become a member today. And of course, none of this would be possible without um, the contributions of, of our funders, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, UBC, with uh, the cluster funding. Um, and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Rideout, who is also sponsoring a portion of, of these series as well. Uh, for those of you who are tweeting along and following along, um, here are the, the Twitter and Facebook handles and tags for you all to use today. So without further ado, um, it truly is such an honor for me to present Dr. Samantha Dawson, who goes by Sam. Um, Sam joined the Department of Psychology at UBC as an assistant professor and the director of the Sexuality and Wellbeing Lab in July of 2020. Prior to her appointment, she was a Shirk Banting and IWK Health Center postdoc fellow at Dalhousie University in the Couples and Sexual Health Research Lab, uh, working with another outstanding Canadian women's health researcher, Natalie Rosen. Um, Sam adopts a multi-method approach in her research using a combination of experimental laboratory-based studies and daily experience and longitudinal methodologies in order to identify novel mechanisms contributing to sexual function. The overarching goal of her research program is to use these mechanisms to develop targeted interventions for sexual dysfunction for individuals and couple, couples. Um, and I'll share two fun facts. One fun fact is uh, that I've known Sam for um, quite a long time since uh, before her graduate school. And it has been such an absolute honor and pleasure to watch her research trajectory over time. And I will admit, I uh, did quite a happy dance when UBC made Sam the offer to, to, join, um, uh, to join UBC as a faculty member. And the other fun fact is Sam was raised in Australia until her 20s, but don't be surprised if you don't hear an accent. She lost it within about six months of moving to Canada. So with that, welcome Dr. Dawson. Thank you, Lori. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. 
And we will get started. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm really excited, thrilled to be a part of the seminar series. I'm presenting some of my work that focuses on women's sexual health during the transition to parenthood. So I just want to acknowledge um, that I'm joining from the Vancouver Point Grey campus, uh, which is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation. Um, and you might be joining from uh, other areas in Vancouver or other parts of the world. And so I would just encourage you to take some time to acknowledge uh, the lands and territories where you are located as well. So today I wanna take you on a bit of a journey uh, from bump to baby. And so I'm gonna be start by sharing some of what we know regarding the importance of sexual health generally uh, with a specific focus on the perinatal period as a time of vulnerability for women's sexual function. And perhaps this is not too surprising given that uh, women are the ones who you know, experience pregnancy and also uh, give birth. But a significant proportion of my talk is gonna focus on an often overlooked factor in perinatal sexual health. And this is the interpersonal context. So this context is not just uh, relevant to sexuality, which often occurs within you know, a relationship or a partnership, but I think it's especially relevant for understanding perinatal sexual health, uh, given that the transition to parenthood is often something that occurs within an interpersonal context. I'll be talking about various studies uh, within my research program throughout the presentation. And I'll end by focusing on some of my most recent work um, that I plan to apply to the development of evidence-based psychological interventions to help expectant and new parent couples uh, with this transition. So we know that sexuality is one of the most universal human experiences. In fact, a sign of mental health is healthy sexual expression. According to the World Health Organization, sexual health is fundamental to the physical and emotional health and well being of individuals, couples, and families. So, sex is pretty important. One key component of sexual health that I uh, focus on in my research program is sexual function. So what do we mean by this? So sexual function is comprised of things like arousal, so physiological arousal, as well as the subjective experience of feeling kind of turned on or interested in sex. Sexual desire, which is the motivation or interest in engaging in sexual activity with oneself or a partner. And then sexual satisfaction, which is this global appraisal of both positive and negative aspects of one's sexuality. And so these are all facets of sexual function. We know from research that sexual function uniquely contributes to better mental and physical health outcomes. So for example, we have some research to suggest that engaging in regular sex sexual activity is associated with better heart health, uh, reduced risk of some cancers, stronger immune systems. We also know that sex can be particularly effective for regulating mood and stress. Um, and has even been linked with living longer. We also know that the quality of sex can be an important determinant for overall relationship quality and relationship satisfaction. So really we can conclude here that sexual function leads to better health as well as stronger relationships. We know that many people experience changes to their sexuality throughout the lifespan, and this is quite normative. Uh, we also see changes throughout the course of people's relationships. However, when these changes or problems become persistent, um, as well as associated with distress, so people become worried or concerned, experiencing some anxiety around these uh, difficulties, that's when we would consider a person to have sexual dysfunction. We know that distressing problems with sexual function or sexual dysfunction are relatively common in the general population, with some estimates suggesting up to 28% of Canadian women and 18% of Canadian men have experienced sexual dysfunction within the past year. 
this actually makes sexual dysfunction one of the most common psychological disorders that we have. The perinatal period though, so pregnancy up until about 12 months postpartum is a particularly vulnerable time where we actually see prevalence rates of sexual dysfunction double and almost triple finding some studies finding up to 68% of mothers and up to 45% of partners reporting distressing sexual function problems. Now, why should we care about this? You know, some people might think that sex or sexuality is, you know, somewhat trivial. We know that the impact of perinatal sexual dysfunction though is not in inconsequential. So poor sexual function in the perinatal period is linked with poorer overall health and well-being. Uh, it's been linked with, you know, increased use of health services. There's bidirectional links with postpartum depression and anxiety. Uh, we also know that it's linked with conflict within romantic relationships, as well as uh, relationship dissolution. I mean, it's even been linked with less sensitive parenting. Despite the prevalence of perinatal sexual dysfunction and these negative impacts, there's actually very few studies identifying uh, novel risk and protective factors associated with these changes. And there's very few evidence-based interventions that specifically target the unique aspects of the perinatal uh, context. I argue throughout this talk that the interpersonal context, so the couple or the relationship, is really critical for understanding factors contributing to and perpetuating sexual dysfunction. So for example, in other work, in couples where the woman has um, a genital pain or clinically level low levels of sexual desire, which these are two common sexual dysfunctions that are also present in the perinatal period, uh, dyadic studies, so studies sampling couples, have revealed that women's partners also report more distressing sexual problems compared to the partners of women who don't experience sexual dysfunction, really highlighting that partners also experience consequences too to their sexual function. Accounting for the interpersonal context of sexual function is especially relevant during the transition to parenthood because both partners are experiencing changes to their roles and responsibilities within their relationship. As such, an inter interpersonal approach is essential for capturing the dynamic interactions and changes that occur between partners who are each impacted, impact and are impacted by pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing. Other than my own work and the work of my collaborators, much of the previous research on perinatal sexual function has really neglected this interpersonal context, um, sampling individuals rather than couples. And much of this research is cross-sectional um, and is focused largely on risk factors like postpartum depression. My research program and the research I'm sharing with you today uh, seeks to fill some of these critical gaps, uh, not just because I sample couples, um, but also because I follow them longitudinally over time. Um, and I'm also seeking to identify theoretically informed intra as well as interpersonal risk and protective factors that either contribute to or protect against sexual dysfunction. So let's dive in. So in today's presentation, I'm going to try and answer four different research questions. So first, I want to know, is sexual function actually compromised in the perinatal period? And if it is, what does this change look like? What is, the, what is happening for individuals and couples? I'll then talk about a couple of studies that have focused on uh, whether or not change occurs similarly for everyone, or if indeed there are some individuals and some couples that are at greater risk of sexual dysfunction than others. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about my work identifying some novel risk and protective factors that are associated with either the onset or the persistence of sexual dysfunction during this critical time. So given that sexual dysfunction is relatively common generally, right? So 28% of uh, women, 18% of men, a logical question is whether or not sexual function is indeed compromised during the perinatal or postpartum period. And so most of the previous research 
um, report sexual dysfunction prevalence rates, you know, in the population, um, and then, you know, contrast that with the prevalence observed in their specific study. But in the first study I'm going to talk about, I actually wanted to directly compare couples who had had a baby in the past year compared to those who were not in the transition to parenthood to really see uh, how these um, prevalence rates matched up um, over time. So to answer this, we compared sexual function across two different samples of couples. So I recruited a sample of 104 couples who had not had a child in the past two years, so not in the transition to parenthood, um, as well as a sample of 99 first-time parent couples. And something I want to note here uh, before I you know, proceed in my presentation is that all of my research is inclusive with respect to sex and gender, as well as um, sexual orientation. And so I'm intentionally using uh, the term mothers and partners uh, throughout the presentation. So in all of the research that I'll be presenting, uh, the person who was the gestational parent or person that gave birth, uh, in all of these studies, they actually identified as female, woman, uh, and mother. Uh, whereas I use the term partners intentionally to capture the variability in that group where people identify as men, women, uh, non-binary, um, and other descriptions. So um, using the term mothers and then partners throughout. So we had um, our first time parent couples complete measures assessing their sexual desire, their sexual satisfaction, and their sexual distress. So different facets of sexual function at three, six, and 12 months postpartum. And we wanted to compare them to our, our non-parent, our couples that were not in the transition to parenthood. So compared to those uh, community control couples, new parent couples reported lower sexual desire and lower sexual satisfaction and higher sexual distress, so more worries and concerns at all time points. So at three, six, and 12 months postpartum. These group differences did become less pronounced as we approached 12 months postpartum, but they were still uh, there. Um, interestingly, some of you might be wondering, you know, what was the impact of, you know, sexual frequency? So by six months postpartum, our couples didn't actually differ in terms of uh, frequency of sexual activity. Uh, so these differences that I'm reporting here don't seem to be explained by, you know, overall differences in how often couples are engaging in sex. In the control group of couples, our partners didn't differ in desire, satisfaction, or distress. So the women and their partners were reporting similar levels of desire, satisfaction, and distress. However, in our new parent couples, uh, mothers pers uh, experienced persistently lower sexual desire compared to their partners at all time points. Um, and when we looked at you know, clinically significant levels, we found that between 39 and 59% of mothers reported clinically low levels of sexual desire and between 47 and 50% of mothers reported clinically high levels of sexual distress at all time points. So the takeaway here is that yes, sexual function does indeed appear to be kind of impaired or compromised during this transition, um, that these difficulties seem to persist up until 12 months, and that mothers perhaps are the most vulnerable. Now that study was a promising first step in really understanding, you know, relative difficulties in sexual function across the postpartum period uh, because we had that control group. But in this next study, um, I wanted to model change over time, this time beginning in pregnancy. I wanted to know how does sexual function actually change during this perinatal period? What is the overall pattern? So to do this, we recruited and sampled 203 first-time parent couples and began following them in pregnancy, so uh, at 20 weeks. And we got both partners to complete measures of sexual function and measures of sexual distress uh, twice in pregnancy and then at four times uh, after the baby was born. And so this uh, approach allowed me to model how sexual function changed in pregnancy, but also how it changed um, postpartum. And to do this, I used something called dyadic latent growth curve modeling. So looking first at sexual function, so overall levels of sexual function, uh, we have time, this will be the, um, all of my figures look like this. Uh, so we have time on the x-axis here and sexual function score on the y-axis. Um, and I converted sexual function scores so that we could compare uh, women and men. 
The dashed line here is the clinical cutoff. So if you're below that line, it indicates clinically significant uh, problems with sexual function. So what we found here for mothers and partners, so mothers are in red and partners are in green, uh, that there were significant declines for both people uh, in their sexual function from mid-pregnancy through to three months postpartum with significant improvements from three to 12 months postpartum. Uh, we also found significant interdependence. So at three months postpartum, uh, mothers and partners sexual function were positively correlated, really highlighting that interpersonal interdependence uh, between within the context of the couple. Um, also apparent in this figure though, is that mothers ex seem to be experiencing more marked changes than their partners. Uh, with their sexual function actually remaining uh, below that clinical cutoff at all time points. As I mentioned at the start of my talk, sexual distress, so these are worries, concerns, anxieties about one's sexuality, um, is a necessary component for a diagnosis of sexual dysfunction. And what's really interesting here is despite both partners experiencing significant changes to their sexual function across the perinatal period, uh, only mothers actually experienced significant changes in sexual distress. So partners distress remained kind of low and stable. Whereas for mothers, we actually saw a significant increase in sexual distress from pregnancy to three months. And even though we did see some improvement, so it decreased uh, in the postpartum period, at all time points, uh, mother's sexual distress was above clinical uh, cutoffs. So the findings from these two initial studies really support that both mothers and their partners experienced significant changes to sexual function during the transition to parenthood. So declines in pregnancy with some improvements in the postpartum period and that mothers seem to be at greater risk of sexual dysfunction compared to partners. One thing though I noticed when I was doing those two studies is that there was significant variability or variance in the scores. And this really seemed to hint at to me that how sexual function uh, changes during this vulnerable period might not be the same for everyone. So are there some individuals or are there some couples for whom they're at greater risk of sexual dysfunction during this time. Up until this point though, no research had really attempted to explain uh, this potential variability. So what do I mean here? So I thought that it was possible that not everyone would follow the same trajectory. You know, perhaps there'd be some individuals or couples who are at greater risk than others. Um, and you know, an important aspect of this approach is can we learn from the couples who are perhaps not vulnerable to experiencing these changes? Can we learn what they're doing well and apply it to those groups that are experiencing uh, challenges during this time? So what this might look like here is in green, we have a trajectory of people who aren't really experiencing problems. Their sexual function remains stable over time. In purple, we see a different group who perhaps are experiencing some problems initially but over the passage of time, we're seeing significant improvement. And so by 12 months, they're looking really similar to our green trajectory. And then in red, we have a group of people who you know, are experiencing problems that are either you know, remaining persistently uh, problematic or perhaps even worsening over time. So these are three potential uh, trajectories. I'm sure there's more. The bolded line here though, this depicts what happens when we ignore potential variants, we ignore heterogeneity, and we just take the average, which is what previous research has done. So consistent with that earlier research, uh, we would see overall improvement over time in sexual function. However, this might not accurately capture people's unique experiences. And so in the next two studies I'm going to talk about, I was really interested in examining whether or not there were unique trajectories at the level of the individual, as well as at the level of the couple. And again, if we can identify who is most at risk, then we can use this information to inform early assessment, as well as targeted intervention practices. 
So in this first study, uh, we recruited 646 first-time mothers from the IWK ultrasound clinic in Halifax. Uh, so during their diagnostic imaging appointment at 20 weeks, and women completed online surveys uh, assessing their sexual function at three, six, and 12 months postpartum. And I used something called late, latent class growth analysis based on structural equation modeling to determine whether or not sexual function was best captured by one or multiple unique trajectories. And I used uh, clinical cutoffs to interpret the trajectories. So I thought we would take a little uh, break from listening to me present, um, and I want to share a brief video here. So we actually made this based on the published study um, that's part of the post baby hanky panky knowledge sharing initiative. It's only a minute long, um, but it was an exciting way for us to translate these findings to uh, expectant mothers. If you just had your first baby, you can probably already tell that your life is going to be a lot different now. Um, can, can everyone hear the, the sound on that? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. One difference may have to do with your sex life. You might be wondering if these changes are here to stay or if they will go back to the way they were. And well, there's really not one answer to that question. Our study found that new mom's sexuality is not the same for everyone. Some moms don't report significant problems at all. Some moms had moderate problems, but by a year after giving birth, they weren't having these problems anymore. But some moms had more significant problems, and these moms continued to have problems at 12 months postpartum. Our study also found that if moms were worried about these changes or if they were causing conflict with their partner, they were more likely to be in one of the groups of new moms that are having longer lasting sexual problems after having a baby. If this sounds familiar, there are things that can help. Try talking openly with your partner about how sex has changed for you and talk to your healthcare provider if you are really concerned. And remember, changes to your sex life are normal after a baby. We all change and react in different ways and that's okay. So as I mentioned, that's part of a knowledge uh, translation initiative uh, led by my collaborator, Dr. Natalie Rosen at Dalhousie University um, called the Post Baby Hinky Panky. And if you're interested, uh, some of the results from that study were recently published in terms of you know, the benefits of this campaign, uh, not just for uh, new or expectant uh, mothers and parents, but also for healthcare prof professionals that are working uh, within the perinatal health context. So back to me. So as I shared in the video, um, our results revealed three uh, unique trajectories best fit our new sample of mothers. Um, so these are the actual trajectories here. So we can see uh, that there's a green kind of minimal problems trajectory. Um, so they're above the clinical cutoff. But then there's two trajectories, um, two groups that are experiencing cl clinically significant problems at three months postpartum. Um, for one group, the group in purple here, uh, their problems seem to resolve simply with the passage of time so that by 12 months postpartum, uh, they're actually above the clinical cutoff. Whereas our trajectory in red, this would be our high risk uh, group. Uh, so their problems are more persistent. And so this is the group that's gonna benefit most from early assessment and intervention uh, in a clinical context. Given that I've argued that sex is inherently interpersonal um, and that couples navigate this transition together, it might make sense to see if, you know, there's also couples that are more at risk of persistent difficulties um, and perhaps even that couples are influencing one another or adding to one another's difficulties. So are there some couples that are more vulnerable to perinatal sexual dysfunction? So in this study, this is using data from that same uh, 203 couples that I spoke about earlier. We're following them from pregnancy through to 12 months postpartum. Uh, but I'm going to be reporting on different outcome measures. So they completed measures assessing their sexual satisfaction, their sexual desire, as well as their sexual distress. And the goal here was to see if there were distinct classes of trajectories at the level of the dyad or the couple, rather than at the level of the individual. 
And doing so would allow us to identify couples who are at high risk of problems. Also by looking at multiple facets of sexual function, we're also able to see if all aspects change in the same way or if there's variability depending on the outcome that we assess. So in these analyses, we ex um, extracted classes, as I mentioned, at the level of the couple. And so these are the findings for sexual satisfaction. And so what we found is that a two class model best fit our data. Class one captured 36 uh, percent of couples uh, where both mothers and partners were reporting low levels of sexual satisfaction. Whereas class two captured uh, 64 percent of couples that were reporting high levels of sexual satisfaction. Uh, so scores on this measure actually cap at 35. So we have some highly sexually satisfied couples here and perhaps we can take what's going on for them and apply it to the group that are experiencing lower levels of sexual satisfaction. For sexual desire, we saw something different. So we actually saw that a three class model best fit our data. Um, we had a high desire uh, group, so in green here, um, that captured around 25% of our couples. We had in purple, a moderate sexual desire uh, group. So this was 36% of our couples. And then I just wanna draw your attention to uh, the, the dyadic trajectories that are in red. So what I'm calling the discrepant sexual desire group. So this is 39% of our couples. Um, so in this group, uh, mothers actually are reporting clinically low levels of sexual desire, whereas partners are actually reporting quite high sexual desire. Um, so a desire discrepancy. And what we know from work, you know, both within the perinatal context, but also outside is that desire discrepancies, so significant differences in sexual desire between partners, is one of the most common problems that we see uh, clinically. And so this group might be at the greatest risk of problems uh, to their romantic relationship, given that at 12 months, that difference or desire discrepancy is really pronounced. Whereas for the other groups, there were some desire discrepancies throughout the transition, but by 12 months, these seem to have resolved. And then for sexual distress, we found a two class model best fit the data. So in green, 76% of people low sexual distress, which is great, uh, but we do have 24% of couples that are falling in this discrepant sexual desire class where mothers are reporting clinically high levels of sexual distress, sorry, sexual distress, not desire, uh, whereas partners are reporting kind of low levels of sexual distress. And this might be related to the fact that, you know, perhaps mothers are experiencing more marked changes to their sexual function overall. So couple sexual function uh, over time was heterogeneous. We saw lots of variability. We also saw evidence that not all facets of sexual function showed the same pattern of change over time or the same number of classes. And so this really suggests that some aspects of sexual function might be more impacted by the perinatal context uh, than others. One thing I didn't mention though, that I also examined uh, was you know, overlap in class membership. So if you were in a low sa sexual satisfaction class, did that mean you were also in you know, a high sexual distress class, for example? And surprisingly, we actually found a lot of um, variability where just because you were low in one facet didn't mean that you were low across the board. Um, which is interesting too, in terms of how we might approach treatment. So we've established that there does indeed appear to be evidence that some women and some couples are at greater risk of perinatal sexual dysfunction. So what are the factors that are associated with this increased risk? What can we do with this information? So specifically, I'm really interested in modifiable factors. So things that we can change, things that we can target uh, in the development of evidence-based interventions. So I'm more focused on psychological and interpersonal factors uh, rather than you know, things we can't change like biological or biomedical factors related to labor and delivery that we can't actually target in an intervention. I'm also really interested in interpersonal processes. So things that occur with, between partners. So one framework that I use uh, to inform a lot of my uh, research is the biopsychosocial model. And it really proposes that perinatal sexual function is influenced by a combination of biological, psychological, and then social interpersonal factors. 
So biological factors here um, include, you know, physiological and hormonal changes that are associated with pregnancy and the postpartum period. Um, they might also include things related to labor and delivery. And these are thought to contribute to sexual function problems through physiological mechanisms. Uh, we know that sexual function can also be inhibited by psychological variables uh, that are known to interfere with desire and arousal. So things like, you know, perinatal depression and anxiety and psychological factors. Um, they might also perpetuate how sexual function evolves over time, um, you know, ensuring that they become more persistent difficulties. And then social and interpersonal factors. So this could be, you know, poor stress management, poor ways of coping with one's partner, uh, feeling less connected uh, to one's partner. These are thought to inhibit sexual function uh, by reducing feelings of intimacy and connectedness. And both psychological and social interpersonal factors, um, they might also help to explain why partners of women um, often experience negative consequences to their sexual function during this period as well. So evidence from largely cross-sectional research suggests that perinatal sexual function is either negatively associated with or unrelated to, so the research is quite equivocal, uh, to mode of delivery, uh, whether or not someone has an episiotomy, whether or not uh, labor was induced, uh, the degree of perennial uh, tearing, um, oh, I missed epidural, whether or not uh, someone has an epidural, uh, tearing, and then whether or not a person breastfeeds. Uh, so mixed research to support these as linked with changes in sexual function. In contrast, psychosocial variables, so uh, sexual frequency or whether or not there's sexual problems in pregnancy, uh, level of fatigue, uh, level of postpartum depression, whether or not someone is distressed or concerned about changes to their sexuality, as well as uh, relationship dissatisfaction, these have been more consistently linked with problems with postpartum uh, sexual function in the literature. So using the study that I talked about earlier, where we sampled 646 first-time mothers and we found those three unique trajectories, uh, we also explored the role of these biopsychosocial predictors in predicting membership in the trajectories that had those problems. So the moderate and marked problems trajectory. So the first takeaway um, is that none of the biomedical factors uh, were significant predictors of membership in either the moderate or marked problem trajectory. So biomedical, biological factors didn't seem to be that relevant. When sexual function in pregnancy and then the four significant psychosocial variables uh, were combined into a multivariate model, we found that uh, three factors consistently predicted group membership. So specifically being higher in sexual distress, so having more anxiety, worry, and concern about changes to one's sexual relationship, uh, increase the odds of membership in the moderate and marked problems trajectory. Whereas having a better sexual function in pregnancy and having a stronger connection with one's partner, these actually lowered the odds of membership in those trajectories. Over the past kind of year and currently, uh, my collaborators and I have been exploring other factors that might relate to either predicting membership in specific trajectories or uh, how these factors might predict uh, how sexual function changes over time. So the degree of improvement or the degree of decline. So in two different samples of couples, so a sample of 99 couples and a sample of 203 couples, I've examined the link between postpartum depression and sexual function for mothers and partners. And what's really cool about this research is that it's revealed not only that, you know, when an individual has higher levels of postpartum depression, you know, that's linked with their own lower sexual function. We've also found evidence that when a partner experiences higher levels of uh, postpartum depression, that's linked with their partner's lower sexual function. So really highlighting the interpersonal context, not just for sexuality, but also for mood or postpartum depression. With a PhD student um, at Dalhousie University that I'm working with, Megan Rossi, uh, we've also made demonstrated links between sexual function and attitudinal factors, something called destiny and growth beliefs. 
Um, so this idea that relationships involve work and effort, effort uh, which is a growth belief, versus this idea that relationships are meant to be, uh, which is destiny. So these implicit beliefs about sexuality, these tend to become more salient or more important uh, during sexual challenges. Um, and they're associated with how individuals respond to these challenges or these difficulties, which might affect their sexual function. So in a longitudinal dyadic study, we found that when expectant mothers reported stronger destiny beliefs, so this idea that relationships are meant to be and don't require work, uh, when they reported higher destiny beliefs in pregnancy, they uh, reported higher levels of sexual distress and lower sexual satisfaction uh, at three months postpartum. With my honor student right now, Laura Radovic, um, we just examined some cross-sectional data from a new uh, longitudinal study that's ongoing, uh, looking at the role of body image self-consciousness during sex and sexual function. So using data from 125 first-time parent couples, um, we found that when pregnant mothers reported higher levels of body image self-consciousness, um, both they and their partner uh, reported lower levels of sexual function. And one potential mechanism that we're interested in exploring is, you know, is the sexual activity itself changing? Uh, and is that what's related to, you know, lower levels of satisfaction, lower levels of arousal, problems with orgasm? With another PhD student um, at Dalhousie, Yvonne Brandelli, uh, we're examining the link between touch attitudes and sexual behaviors across the perinatal period. So we know that touch is really important for uh, interpersonal relationships in general. And we're actually finding that, you know, people that have more positive uh, touch attitudes in pregnancy, including more positive attitudes about using touch, this is non-sexual touch, uh, for emotion regulation, they're actually reporting greater sexual and affectionate behaviors throughout the transition to parenthood. Um, so this could be a protective factor in terms of, you know, navigating changes to the sexual relationship. And then lastly, uh, with another PhD student at Dal, uh, Perry Tudelman, we examined the link between common dyadic coping, so how couples cope uh, together or jointly with stress and sexual distress. And so we found that when couples reported uh, better managing stress together, they each reported lower sexual distress at three months postpartum, highlighting again another interpersonal process that we might be able to target in intervention. So given all of the stressors that are inherent to this perinatal period and this transition, we wanted to follow up on this interesting link between common dyadic coping um, and sexual function, but using a different methodology that I haven't talked about. So a daily diary methodology. Um, so this is work being done by a PhD student, Grace Schwenk, again at Dow with my collaborator, Natalie Rosen. And so we were interested in examining the link between common dyadic coping and sexual function during a period of peak vulnerability. So at three months postpartum, when most couples have resumed sexual activity and are likely experiencing challenges to their sexual relationship for the first time. So a great example of common dyadic coping would be responding to your partner's stress or concern by saying, you know, this is a really difficult problem or this is a huge stressor, but we're gonna get through it. You know, what do you think are the best next steps? What can we do next together? And outside of the sexual context, common dyadic coping has been linked with benefits for interpersonal relationships. So things like higher relationship satisfaction and uh, higher relationship quality, but hasn't been linked with sexual outcomes. So data collection for this study is ongoing. So this is just a preliminary teaser at the effects. Um, so this study, we're recruiting first-time parent couples mid-pregnancy. We're following them right up until their baby's 15 months old. So we're really interested, you know, lots of stuff changes at 12 months. People go back to work. People often stop breastfeeding. Um, so we're interested to see what happens if we kind of extend that period of uh, follow-up. But what's really cool about this study is that this use of the daily diary methodology, which typically isn't used uh, during the transition to parenthood, probably because of you know, feasibility issues. Um, but again, I mentioned we chose to use the daily diary method because we wanted to see you know, what's happening in the dynamic day-to-day -day changes that couples experience um, as they might be navigating you know, a particularly stressful time in their sexual relationship as they're you know, uh, reinitiating sex uh, with one another. 
So what we found here, uh, so this is a graph of an actor partner interdependence model that allows us to look at actor effects. So how one's own uh, common dyadic coping is linked with their own outcome as well as partner effects. So how one's own uh, dyadic coping is linked with their partner's sexual outcomes. So what we found is that on days when women and their partners reported higher common dyadic coping, so uh, coping with stressors together, compared to their average across all of the days, they also reported higher sexual satisfaction that day. We also found that when partners reported higher dyadic coping, um, there was a significant link with their women's partners, the pregnant uh, person's uh, higher reports of sexual satisfaction that same day. So we're evidence of actor and partner effects. And so this growing body of research really highlights that psychosocial more than biological factors appear to strongly influence uh, one's own and one's partner's sexual function day to day, as well as over time. Um, and those most recent results is part of an ongoing study where we're examining another, a number of other psychosocial factors that might be important determinants of sexual function during this period. So to summarize, I talked a little bit about, you know, is sexual function compromised in the perinatal period? Um, how does, what do these changes look like? We've identified that some individuals and couples experience this differently and are at greater risk. And that we know, you know, a growing body of evidence supporting some intra and interpersonal risk and protective factors. But what are the implications of this work? How can we take this information um, to better the health and well-being of the 380,000 uh, Canadian couples that become parents each year? So how can we uh, better their health and well-being during this really vulnerable period? So my own data uh, has revealed that less than 20% of expectant mothers and couples receive any information about what to expect with regards to changes in their sexual relationship during the perinatal period, other than contraception. So what I think these findings can do first um, is really normalize that change is normal and that change isn't the same for everyone. And so this can be useful for providing important psychoeducation to women, to couples about what to expect during uh, this transition, might help to normalize their experience, reduce some of that distress, provide more realistic expectations, um, which might just help them better together navigate the transition in these changes. I think these findings could also have important implications for assessment and early intervention. So clinicians could be uh, assessing sexual function in pregnancy and at three months postpartum, similar to how we assess things like uh, perinatal depression and anxiety, um, to identify people who are at most at risk of problems. So using this information, uh, clinicians could determine a couple's or a woman's uh, risk of continued problems at 12 months using our trajectory. So kind of seeing where people are at and then kind of predicting over time where they might be at 12 months. And then using that to inform who's going to uh, benefit most from early intervention versus whose difficulties are likely to resolve simply with the passage of time. And then as I alluded to in the beginning, the work that I'm doing right now uh, really focused on identifying uh, interpersonal as well as intrapersonal factors that are linked with sexual function uh, will be important for the development of uh, novel uh, psychologically based perinatal sexual health interventions that account for this interpersonal context. And given that we have some evidence to support that online interventions that are accessible from home actually show the strongest benefits for relationship outcomes during the perinatal period. I'm really interested in developing some kind of online intervention um, to increase access to, uh, to services for you know, all, of the, all of the mothers and partners and couples uh, that are going through this transition. So I just wanna thank uh, our generous funding so sources. So the CHR, SHRC, um, as well as my collaborators, so Dr. Natalie Rosen at Dalhousie, Dr. Emily Impet at U of T, and Dr. Amy Muse at York, um, all of the research assistants and my research team here at the Sexuality and Wellbeing Lab at UBC, um, as well as my research team at the Couples and Sexual Health Research Lab at Dalhousie. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you very much, Dr. Dawson. That's uh, an impressive um, array of projects and, and wonderful to see where the work is gonna go. So just wanna encourage everyone to please use the chat function um, to post your questions and I'll uh, moderate it. Um, Dr. Galea has a question. Go ahead, Lisa. You're muted. Sorry, I know my, <laughs> all of a sudden things are popping up and I couldn't unmute. Um, so thank you so much for a great talk. Um, it brought me back thinking about <laughs> my own situation as, uh, as that often does when people give talks. Um, so, I, so I missed right at the end, you were talking about how few people got any information about, uh, you know, how their sexual relationship might change uh, post baby. So I just wanted to know that number again. And also, is there any evidence that um, there's more or less distress and dysfunction or sexual function, less sort of sexual function uh, with a second baby or third baby? Yeah. So um, the stat in terms of access to information, it's less than 20% of people. So it's like a huge focus of kind of like my kind of knowledge translation and KT initiative is to like really bridge that gap and get, you know, this information, all of this new data out there because it really will benefit, you know, clinicians, but also, uh, kind of couples, I'm yeah. um, just going to analyze this whole thing. Yeah, uh, so it's wild that we yeah. focus just on contraception, um, and not really kind of normalizing any of these changes. And then uh, your second question was second about baby. second yeah. and third baby. Second, yeah, yeah. Because I remember, I, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so we have some data. So like for, you know, these studies, we actually include people who have a second baby or a second pregnancy, like within the study period. Uh, but we actually have like in that large sample of 646 women, um, we have like a significant proportion, like 130 of them that had a subsequent pregnancy. So I'm really interested in looking at how that impacts the trajectory. Like the reason we don't include it here is because we know that there's additional stressors and it's like, you know, sure. that could uh, influence the results. But um, I'm running some analyses now looking at trajectories specific to genital pain, uh, postpartum genital pain. And so we're gonna look at a subsequent pregnancy um, and delivery on genital pain trajectories. So it'll be interesting to see because I would expect that it would, you know, exacerbate these difficulties, um, but you never know. Yeah, I mean, I think it probably also depends on, you know, what they experienced for the first pregnancy mm -hmm. too, right? So you can imagine, it, you know, and that some of those, you know, with the individual variability, which I loved, um, but, you know, the ones that are improving, they might not have, they might be the stable one next time. Yeah. So that would be a really interesting thing to see how that, how those kind of relationships. Yeah, are. and I can imagine too, if, you know, if you've experienced that, oh, like our sexuality bounces back eventually, but that could really like, you know, minimize the stress that you're going to experience. Like, it's like, oh, this is normal. We'll get back to normal. Um, but there is some data like on relationship outcomes that I think it takes until your child's about 12 for your relationship satisfaction to actually get back to pre-pregnancy, like pre-first baby levels. So this is like a long transition. So if we can shorten that and like strengthen people's relationships um, <laughs> yeah. more quickly, that'd be great. Thank you very much. I just, I don't, uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm just th thinking back to talking to my doctor about the second one saying, oh, I remember my desire was really, really low, like, because she was wanting to talk to me about contraceptives, contraception, yeah. right? And I said, oh, I, you know, I know I won't really need it for a while. And she said, no, be careful with the second one. It comes back faster and stronger. And let me just say to those young people in the audience, it did. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how much real evidence there is for it, but I, it's something that always stuck with me. Thank but that's you. one of the things I'm also looking at is, you know, birth control and how that might also impact some of these trajectories. Because I think that that's really important for women to be making that decision, kind of, you know, knowing, you know, yeah, you're going to experience changes, but the things like contracep contraceptives um, influence these trajectories. Sam, there's another question from uh, Stephanie who asked really interesting talk. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you've included gender diversity in the couples of your sample. I'm curious if you, if you looked at or plan to look at whether these observations are altered or mediated by whether couples are in same sex versus heterosexual couples. And could you offer any predictions about this? Great question. So in the uh, studies that I presented so far, we didn't, um, while our studies were inclusive, we weren't actively targeting or recruiting, um, you know, gender minority, uh, kind of, you know, same gender, gender non-binary couples. Um, but in this most recent studies, so the one that we're kind of 
in the middle of right now, we are. So we actually have a much larger sample of gender diverse, um, mixed and same gender sex couples. So this uh, is something we'll be focusing on, um, you know, because I can imagine that, you know, within, uh, you know, a relationship where there's like two women, for example, that, you know, some of the ways in which they like manage stress together or, you know, cope with, you know, different stresses might be different than compared to like mixed gender, mixed sex uh, relationships. So I'm really interested um, in exploring kind of the ways in which they're different and similar. Um, and then what that might mean in terms of making sure that our interventions are inclusive and um, targeted in terms of who's going to benefit the most and like what what aspects of the intervention, you know, make sense for certain groups versus others, if that's how the data fall out. Great question. Great. And uh, Dr. Suzanne um, Campbell, who's a professor in the UBC School of Nursing and also co-lead of the Women's Health Research Cluster um, with with quite an interest in this topic area. So over to you, Dr. Campbell. Yeah. Thank you so much, Samantha. This was such an enlightening um, discussion and your research is amazing and so needs to be done as a postpartum nurse who would send people out after you know, 24, 48 hours of delivery, talk, trying to talk to them about sex. And they were mm -hmm. like, you know, um, one of my curiosities, and I think it came up was the lactating folks because that decrease in vaginal um, lubrication and the orgasm and spurting milk possibilities, those are areas in lactation is my focus of where we really can prepare parents, but I loved your focus on normalizing and opening up the dialogue and discussion and getting the couples to work together. So I, I was listening carefully and I don't know if I missed something specific to lactation. Yeah, so I've looked at um, in all of the studies, I only reported the effects for one. So we don't find that breastfe breastfeeding has a significant impact on overall sexual function. Um, it's possible if I looked at like just the lubrication subscale, we might see something. And so that's kind of a goal for future, for future work. But as a whole, we don't see differences between kind of breastfed versus non um, breastfeeding. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of like normalizing, like I know for, you know, many, uh, for many women, like breasts become like this non-sexual, you know, aspect that maybe was important to them pre-baby. Um, so I think, you know, education and normalizing that that change is normal. Or one of the things I'm interested in is how we can promote like sexual flexibility during this transition. So sex might not look the same as what it looked like before, but um, that's okay. Um, and how to kind of just allow that flexibility to ease the transition um, a little bit more, yeah. Well, and I think part of it too, and that's why I'm bringing up healthcare providers, because the more that you can access the people to educate them, whether pre-licensure or practitioners, of when to bring up these conversations and when to actually talk about it, the differences, as Lisa said, you know, relevant to which pregnancy it is, if there are other kids at home, what privacy is available, are the babies, you know, sleeping nearby, all those other factors that can be so important. But the other piece that may have come out in the data is the vaginal births where there was tearing or episiotomies or other components, because I know I would often then again, talk to parents about positioning and other options and getting creative. And did that come out at all? So we didn't see it um, predicting membership in kind of the problematic trajectories. I'll be interested to see. I know that like things like episiotomy and perineal tearing have been more specific to like genital pain. Um, so we're doing that, those analyses right now. Um, but I would like love to connect with you in terms of how we can translate some of this, this work to the people that are working with uh, women and couples, just because it is so important, like that knowledge translation piece. And um, it's been funny trying to publish some of this work in like obstetrics and gynecology journals, and they don't want to touch it because it's like psychological and not biomedical. Um, but it's like, these are the people that need to hear this work. Um, well, and it's so connected, right? And I mean, as a lactation consultant, uh, I would say, you know, 80% of people coming in with breastfeeding problems really had either some psych type of postpartum depression or psychological components, or were having 
sexual problems or, you know, there were a million other reasons why they were connecting. That's why just having people aware to pick up on those cues and um, refer to where they can get help for it. Absolutely. Yeah, that Sorry, sounds like an amazing note to end on. And uh, for all of you still on the screen, just take note of Dr. Dawson's coordinates. I think there's going to be lots of follow up. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, we're really excited to, to watch your work and support it through collaboration and in any way that we can. So thank you all for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thanks.